A very good day to you and welcome to the program. We are taking this program in a kiwi fruit plantation. It's um, one of my son's very special projects. He's growing kiwi fruit. They'll be ready in about another two years time. One thing about agriculture, it teaches you to be patient. <laughs> my dear friend, uh, I just felt this morning in my heart when I got up very early, I need to reflect on what God did and what God is still doing through the mighty men revival or the mighty men phenomenon, maybe is a better word. And it's a simple story and it's not just for men. So please, ladies, children, listen up. It's a, a story that will increase your faith. It will increase your faith to believe for the impossible. You see, where there's no vision, the people perish. It is clearly stated in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. The New King James says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. If you've got nothing to get up for in the morning, you don't get up. You need vision. Now, God gave me a vision in 2003. And I want you to listen to the story because I really believe that it can impact your personal life so that you can go out there once the Lord Jesus Christ gives you a clear word and you can fulfill the Great Commission, which is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I think you'll find that in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. 2003, my wife Jill and I went up to a game reserve in the northern part of our province of Natal. And we'd booked a little cottage and I was exhausted. I'd been preaching 24-7. And I sat in this little cottage and I was having a quiet time early one morning. Now to give you a little bit of a backdrop, when I left the, the game reserve, I was going back home and I was going to start on a rigorous evangelistic um, session of going to India. I'd never been to India before, going to Newfoundland. I didn't even know where Newfoundland was. I was gonna go, I was fully booked for the rest of the year, but I was already tired and worn out. Now I'm sitting there early in the morning having a cup of tea, and I saw the game walking past, the antelope. It was beautiful, a couple of giraffe. And as I was sitting there looking out the window, having my quiet time with the same book, I was reading systematically. I read my Bible systematically. I don't jump around. And I got to the book of Revelation. And I, look, I was look, reading from Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4. And basically what the Lord said very clearly to me is that I had lost my first love. I was shattered. I couldn't believe this. This is like God talking to me personally. Angus, you have forsaken your first love. Repent, which means stop it. Otherwise, I will take the candlestick from you. Now, to me, I interpret the candlestick as the light, and the light is the Holy Spirit. And any preacher will tell you if the Holy Spirit departs from him, it's like a nightmare. You can't get on the platform or in the pulpit and preach when you know God is not with you. Especially me, because I have no natural talents, as per se. The Lord said to me very clearly, Go back home, okay, in my heart, not audibly, in my heart. Go back home, cancel all your uh, appointments. Now, some of these people had been waiting for me for two years. They'd done the advertising and everything. Cancel all your appointments. And I want you to rest in me. And I want you to mentor young men. That was it. I was shattered. I said to Jill, this is what the Lord said to me. I think she was quite relieved because she could probably see that I was working myself literally to death. Well, I went home and I did exactly what God had told me. I want to say to you, my dear friend, obedience is better than sacrifice. And to obey than to sacrifice the fat of lambs. That's what the Bible says. And I started phoning and the first miracle took place. Now, when you're in God's will, I'm getting excited now telling you this, the doors start to open when you, when you obey God. If you look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 8, the Word of God says, the Lord says, I have seen your works. I set before you 
an open door that no man can close. Because I see that you have little strength, but you have not denied my name and you have kept the faith. I want to say to you, when we start being obedient to God, then the doors open. When we are trying to work a good idea, it's not a God idea, it doesn't work. Just believe me, don't have to go down that road. Don't have to reinvent the wheel. I wish somebody had told me that. So I started phoning all the people that I had uh, uh, accepted invitations from. And you know, my dear friend, every single one of them, every single one of them said to me, Angus, if God has told you not to come, then we are quite happy with that and we are quite easy with that. That was the first miracle. Now I'm sitting at home because my boys are running the farms. I've got nothing to do. I'm saying, now what must I do now, Lord? He says, I want you to mentor young men. I thought maybe three or four men. I really mean that with all my heart. Well, I, let, I, I know how to advertise. I'm an evangelist. I know how to put out um, posters and go, go ballistic on the media. I felt the Lord say to me, I want you to send out one email, one liner. We're meeting at Shalom. You're welcome. And um, that was it. 240 men arrived. I will never forget it as long as I live. I never knew half of them. They came on the Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday lunchtime, Saturday night, Sunday morning, and then the boys went home. Well, the fire came down. God did an amazing thing. On the Sunday, I said, boys, thanks for coming. I'm going to pray about it and see if we can have another one next year. And they said to me, we come in anyway. <laughs> right, the next year, same story. Sent out a small little one-liner email. One-liner, that's all. 600 men arrived. Now, I must tell you about this. We were having the meetings in our little church building, our tabernacle. We had 600 men. I'm talking about real men. They were farmers. They were miners. They were businessmen. They were sportsmen. And, uh, you know, you're going to ask me the question, uh, Angus, how, how, where's the cutoff? How old must a, a man be before he can come? Well, I used the old foot trekkers uh, standard. If a boy could shoot a rifle and if he could ride a horse, he was a man. So we, we had some 12-year-old men <laughs> uh, with, with their dads. And that's what made it so special, of course. Well, folks, I want to tell you something that happened. The longest church service that I have ever been involved in took place on that weekend. You see, every single mighty man every year has got specifics. This one was a Saturday. Now think about this carefully. We had a... a, a a tin roof, okay, 600 men squashed in. There was no ventilation, no air conditioners, nothing. We were on the farm, right? We'd given them a lovely lunch, big braai. They had lamb chops. They had burrovos. They had steak. They had putu. They had cabbage. They had beans. You name it, everything, okay? After we'd finished, 2 o'clock, when everybody's eyes are half closed, including mine, I'm sitting in, the, in my office saying, Lord, what can I tell them? Because I don't have anything else to say. I felt the Lord say, tell them that without reconciliation, there's no healing. Okay? And so I went in there and I saw these guys. They were sitting there already. Their eyes were closing and I don't blame them. I said, I'm going to be short to the point, 10 minutes, and then we're going to go and have a cup of tea. I said, guys, the Lord tells us very clearly in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we are called to be ambassadors for Him. But in order to be ambassadors for Jesus, we've got to be reconciled to one another. You can't have unforgiveness towards your dad, towards your son, towards your brother if you want God to make you an ambassador for Him. Right? That was basically it. And then... I thought I better finish because the guys were going to sleep. So I said to them, we're going to go and have a cup of tea. And you know, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit works. That's why I love Jesus so much, folks. See, I believe in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oh, yes. And as I was about to close, the Holy Spirit almost physically tapped me on the shoulder and said, Angus, there's a Father and a Son in this meeting that are not talking to each other. They've got no communication with each other. Tell them that they must make up before we leave. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, you must understand pride amongst men. It's a very hard thing for a big grown-up man in front of 600 men to ask his son to forgive him or vice versa. It's, in fact, it's impossible, okay, by man's terms. But there's two things God's given me, a thick skin <laughs> and a big mouth. Okay, so I said, I've got a message for you. Before we leave, the Lord says that there's a father and a son in this meeting that are not talking to each other. You've, you've got some breakdown there. The Lord says that you need to reconcile, forgive each other. Otherwise, the Lord can do nothing for you. And I kept quiet. Nothing happened. Now I'm saying, okay, well, I've done what I've done, Lord. No, 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 no. Now the Lord says, tell them again. Second time, I said, boys, maybe you didn't hear clearly. I said, the Lord said that there's a father and a son in this meeting that are not talking to each other. You need to make up before we go out of this hall. I stopped and I waited. Nothing. Now I'm saying, Lord, that's it. I cried. He said, tell them again. I'm telling the honest truth, folks. Some of you watching this program were there in that meeting. It was in 2005. I said, boys. And as I said that, I'll never forget it, folks. A big, strong farmer from the Eastern Cape, and I know him well. And I'm not going to say his name. He stood up on this side of the aisle. We had a, a center portion, then two side portions of men, and two aisles going down either, either side. He stood up, and as he stood up, his son, who was sitting on the other side of the aisle, which tells you the story, equally as big as his dad, in his farm clothes, he stood up and the two started crying and they started walking towards each other. And I said, no, stop there. Stop. I said, you must come up here on the platform. They came up on the platform. They were into each other's arms. They were weeping, asking for forgiveness. And I tell you what, the dam burst. That meeting started at two o'clock. We walked out of that hall at eight o'clock at night without moving. The doors were closed. The ladies came. To make us tea and top us too, they left. They came back at five o'clock to warm up the supper, they left. They came back again at seven and they gave up. They never came back again. And we were in, right in the presence of God. The men were just coming forward. I remember a man who's now a full-time pastor, big, strong man, an ex-policeman. He stood up there, he said, I brought my son to this meeting this weekend. He is playing rugby. He's in the third team or something. Uh, um, at school and I took him out of school and I, I've never really told him that I love him I want to tell you tonight now he's talking through tears he says I want to tell you son I love you at that time right at that moment I saw a big tall 18 year old kid with curly hair come running down the passage and his dad met him in the middle and the two embraced and they started crying that boy went back home and he automatically got into the first team rugby and then he started playing professional rugby for the Bulldogs after that, because his dad told him that he loved him. Three young men came up on the platform. Now their father wasn't even there, but they were talking into the camera because we videoed everything. We've got evidence. Their father had let them down badly. He had got divorced and he was with another woman and they started crying and they, they, they were angry with him. And they said, but dad, we love you and we forgive you. Folks, I'm telling you, there was a queue of men going down the side right down the side of the wall to the back door and another queue from this side, men coming up, just confessing their sins, one after the other. I have never been in a service like that in my whole life and I've never seen one since. At the end of that meeting, the next morning, after we'd finished the, the meeting Sunday morning, I said, boys, I'm going to pray whether we're going to have another one. They said, we're coming back anyway. <laughs> and that's when it started. From there, 1,060, we had to go into a tent. From 1,060 to 7,400 in a big 5,000 seater tent, we saw the fire come down there. Folks, the ladies had only, we were feeding all these men, by the way, for free. God was paying. We were only expecting 5,000 men. We got 7,400 men. Okay, can you imagine, madam, watching this program? Can you imagine having 2,400 men coming to your house to spend the weekend? I'm talking about real men. Os Durant and all these guys from the Free State. I'm talking about huge men. That's exactly what happened. And I'll never forget on the Friday night for the first meal, the kitchen staff called me. They were panicking. They said, Angus, we've only prepared for 5,000 men. 
There's 7,400 men arrived. Please tell them to go easy with the food. I said, of course I will. Well, I was so full of the Holy Ghost and I was so full of joy. I got up on the platform. I said, there's a message from the kitchen. Eat as much as you can. <laughs> but you know, folks, God is so good. You know, I've been to Israel. I've been to Tabgah on the shores of Lake Galilee where Jesus took two sardines and five lo barley loaves and he, he broke them up and he prayed over them and he fed 5,000 men, not including the women and the children. But I've experienced it on this farm. Because you know something? At the end of that weekend, I was sitting in my prayer room on the Sunday morning, for, preparing for the last service. And Peter Hull, a very, very dear brother of mine, he was a, he's got a real servant's heart. He was wearing a bib. He was directing the traffic. He came in and he was, the tears were running down his face. I thought somebody had been run over by a motor car. What's wrong, Pete? He says, Angus, you're not going to believe this, man. He said, we fed those men three meals. Friday night, Saturday lunchtime, Saturday night. Remember, they had to get their breakfast themselves. Three meals. We have just collected the leftovers. 36 baskets of leftovers. 36 divided by three is 12 baskets per meal. Go and have a look in the Word of God and see how many baskets of leftovers they collected when Jesus had fed the 5,000. That's right, exactly 12 baskets. When these type of things happen, you know God is on the move. That was in 2007. Then we had to take a step, a mighty step of faith. You see, what I want to encourage you with, faith begets faith. Faith is contagious, just like doubt is contagious. Keep away from negative people. By this time, I was so pumped up. I stood on the platform on the Sunday morning. I said, boys, next year, how many men are coming? Now they started throwing out all kinds of numbers. I remember one guy saying, 22,000. I said, come on, easy on, boys, because there were 7,400. You know, I took my wife shopping down in Peter Marisburg. I'll never forget the day as long as I live. She was shopping at a uh, 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 shopping mall. I sat there and I'm saying, Lord, I need a big tent. I need a very big tent. But Lord, I got no money. Remember, we take no collections. The Lord said, go for the big one. I phoned up my producer, George Carpenter. I'll never forget it. He was sitting in his office. I said, George, you are the computer boffin. Find out for me where is the biggest tent in the whole world. He said, I'll do it. He phoned me back within five minutes. He says, Agus, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? He said, the biggest tent in the whole world is resident in Johannesburg. I said, I can't believe this. I thought it'd be New York City or maybe Panama or maybe Sydney, Australia. It's in Johannesburg. They brought it out for the Earth Summit. It was built in the UK, enlarged in Europe, and it can seat 30,000 men. Well, I just went cold. How much? <laughs> Four million to hire it. I think I had 500 rand in my pocket. I said, book it. <laughs> when my wife came back, I said, Jill, we've just booked the biggest tent in the world. Well, long story short, 17 Pantechnicans, those are 30-ton rigs, madam. 17 of them brought that tent to this farm. And they took three weeks to put it up. No farmers were allowed to touch it. They didn't want it to fall down. These were professional riggers. Atif and Staden became one of my spiritual sons. He was the tent master. It's something you've never seen in your life. They've got their own weather station. The cables are this thick. If there's a wind, they have to tension them. This thing, if it falls down, it'll kill thousands of men. Then the men started coming. Because now the next thing I panicked about, Lord, what happens if nobody comes? You know, I'm such a doubting Thomas. I don't know why God uses me. My one son-in-law cable tied each chair to the other so they couldn't move them. He cable tied exactly 30,000 chairs inside the tent. When they came, we had 30,000 men inside. Wait for it. And 30,000 men outside. Some men say that was the most special campaign of all for them because it was still big enough to be intimate. Well, I want to tell you, the fire came down like we haven't seen before. 
One Duomini wrote a, an article in the newspaper. This Duomini was sitting in the crowd. And when he arrived there, he said, I'm very glad I'm not sitting on the platform. I'm speaking on the platform. Because these men were men who were no, maybe not accustomed to these kind of meetings. They sat there with their arms folded. What is this guy going to tell us? And then the Holy Spirit started to visit us through the praise and worship, the music. My son was heading up the music, Andy, at the time. And then, of course, their hands fell to their sides. Then they stood up. Then the tears started coming down their cheeks. And they didn't want the guy next to them to see it. And they were wiping away their tears. And then their arms went up in the air and they started to worship God. I want to tell you, folks, uh, I thought I was in heaven. I've never experienced anything like it in my life. That was 2008. I think we killed 24 oxen to feed those men for one meal. And then we had what we call footlongs. They were big sausages. That was another meal using 44-gallon drums cut in half. When I heard them shout, Amen! Like it, it was like a gunshot went right through the district. Some people said they heard that Amen in Greytown, which is our little town, which is 15 kilometers away. Folks, God was there. I said, right, next year we're going open air. Open air because there's no more tents or anything. I want to pray for you. But before I do, I want to tell you this is part one. We're going to do the next session straight after this because I've got something even more exciting to tell you. There was another two years after that, 2009, 2010. And then God told me to pass the baton on to the young men. As I'm recording this program there are 20 different mighty men conferences taking place throughout our nation even in namibia botswana right up on the border with zimbabwe and right down to cape town god is doing this ladies and gentlemen this is revival let me pray for you father i pray for my dear friend watching this program that he'll watch the next session too because it's even more exciting but I pray that he'll start to understand that God is not interested in our ability. He is only interested in our availability. He needs men and women, boys and girls, that are obedient to the call in their lives. Please, Lord, fill them with faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there we have it. That's all you need. How do you get faith, Uncle Angus? Well, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So maybe until the next time. And remember, please don't miss this one. Part two, I'll tell you the rest of the mighty men story. Goodbye.